to really get to 30, 40, 50 percent EVs being sold, you have to appeal to people that, you know, are in that 30 to $35,000 price range. Good afternoon. Welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm David Ignatius, a columnist here at The Post. I'm happy to be joined here at our headquarters in downtown Washington by Mary Barra, the chief executive of General Motors, one of the most prominent executives in America. We're going to talk today about the future of transportation and in, in particular about electric vehicles, which has been a big bet by GM. I want to start, uh, Mary, by asking you about uh, President Biden's visit yesterday to Detroit to the Detroit Auto Show. President Biden said, among other things, that the great American road trip is going to be electrified. It was a, it was a good line. I want to ask you uh, what you uh, would give as an assessment of the administration's efforts on electric vehicles. How important is that to GM and to the future of the industry? And I have to ask a practical question. Suppose we had a future president who didn't feel so strongly about electric vehicles, who reversed the, the momentum that Biden and his administration have, have made in, in, in this direction. What difference would that make for GM? Well, first of all, it's great to be here. So thank you so much, David, for having me. Uh, you know, first of all, I'll start, you know, the, the show was great. For General Motors, it was the first time all of our electric vehicle, our whole portfolio that's, uh, you know, we're selling right now, but that all of our electric vehicles were in one place from the, from the Hummer truck to the, uh, Chevy Equinox EV, the Chevy uh, Silverado EV, the Blazer, uh, so and and more. The the Cadillac Lyric, the, the list goes on. So it was exciting for us to have all of those in one place. And you know, I think it's going to be a very important show when people start to see. First of all, electric vehicles are beautiful at General Motors because. Back in 2018, we started working on a dedicated platform because we recognize if you try to convert an internal combustion engine to a vehicle to an electric, you have to make compromises. You have to compromise on range or performance. The vehicles that we have coming out, there's no compromises, and they're beautiful. Um, so, and and that's not just my opinion. I mean, we're getting really great response every time we reveal a new vehicle, and and our the orders also, or the reservations, or the hand raisers also tell that story. So, I think it's going to be significant from that perspective. Uh, you know, from a from an administration perspective, I think uh, the uh, work that was done on the bipartisan infrastructure bill to make sure there's charging infrastructure. Because when we talk to customers and say, hey, would you consider an electric vehicle? They say, well, first of all, it's got to have the right range, and that's around 300 miles. All of our electric vehicles that are, are out now are coming um, off of the LTM platform are have uh, an option of 300, or sometimes, for instance, the Chevy Silverado EV truck is 400 um, miles of range. So range is important. It's got to be beautifully designed. It has to be at an affordable price point but then they worry about charging infrastructure. So to really uh, make sure that uh, EV adoption grows, the charging infrastructure piece was very important of the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act. So that was key. Not necessarily electric vehicles, but um, really for all vehicles, the CHIPS Act was incredibly important. And, and that's important only to, to make sure we can deliver products that people want, but also from a national security perspective. So I, I want to come back to the, the CHIPS Act, but just to, to stay with the electric vehicles for a minute. GM has made a huge bet on this. Uh, I think GM has announced that by 2025, 40% of your production of vehicles will be fully electric. Uh, that's not far off, a couple of years away. Are you going to meet that target? Are you confident that you're going to meet that target? And what do you think that's going to mean for your profitability? Well, what we have said is that by 2025, we'll be uh, able to build uh, a million uh, 
EVs in the are in North America, and I think that's going to be very significant. We're on track for that, so I think we will do that. Um, you know, clearly as we make the transition and as we continue to ramp up Altium, get it up to. to um, that's your sp your new battery technology. Yeah, the, the 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 platform as we get that up to speed, and also you know we've announced um, we have a plant in Ohio that's building cells in this country. Uh, that's ramping up right now. We'll have another plant next year, another the following year, and another either 12 to 18 months later. As we get our own batteries in these vehicles, as we ramp these plants up, um, each of our, our EVs will be profitable. Uh, and I think that's going to be something that's important. As we continue to work on improving battery technology, in the latter part of the decade is where we start to see that you're going to see parity from where we are from an internal combustion engine. But you also have to understand uh, the requirements of the performance of internal combustion engine vehicles is increasing as well. And to get the, uh, you know, the uh, emissions and the, the cafe regulations, you end up adding more technology. So those costs are going up as well. But, you know, to, to answer your question, um, if something were to change, when people get in an electric vehicle and they get to drive it, um, they realize they're not giving anything up. And an electric vehicle has instant torque. And because of the portfolio of, you know, whether it's an affordable vehicle like the Chevrolet Equinox, all the way up to a super truck like the Hummer, luxury like the Cadillac Lyric, giving people those choices and then, you know, letting them drive the vehicles, I think once they drive them, they're not want to go, they're, they are not want to, want to go back to an internal combustion vehicle. So uh, before we get into more details about electric vehicles and your portfolio, as you said, across your different product lines, I want to ask you a couple more political questions that are very much on people's minds. So today, uh, it appears that we averted a rail strike uh, because of uh, presidential and other intervention. I'm just curious uh, what a rail strike would have meant for GM in terms of your operations uh, and whether you're confident now that the supply situation um, genuinely is going to settle down, that the, that the strike is, really is averted long term. Well, um, I think it was great work by all parties involved to get to a tentative agreement. And, you know, I think now the work is to get the agreement ratified, but I'm very hopeful that will happen. Had there been a strike, it would have been very difficult because in some cases, uh, rail is a very important part of our logistics uh, footprint. And so to have rail shut down, not only our industries, but many industries, it would have, in some cases, had plants closing rather quickly and had a real, a real impact. So I think it was... So just, I'd be curious because that's such an interesting uh, way for people to understand what it, what it would, would have meant, would mean. How quickly would GM have had to close plants if we'd had a rail strike? Well, it depends on the plant specifically, but for instance, um, in the plants that build trucks, uh, the, a truck is built on a frame. Frames are delivered to the plant by rail. And if you can think of how big a truck frame is, that's not something you, you store many of, uh, you know, to have ready in case the, the rail cars aren't um, able to deliver. So that would have had, you know, within the day, it would have had an impact that we would have not had the frame to build the truck. So, you know, that's just one example. Different plants it would have depended on, depending on what uh, that plant depends on for rail delivery every day. But also very important, rail, many, in many cases, it's trucks and rail, but rail is how vehicles are delivered, um, at least leaving the plant to a, maybe a distribution center to the dealer. And so it also would have, uh, you know, really impacted getting vehicles to customers. So it would have been significant from that perspective as well. Another thing that people are focused on in this political season, uh, but just focused on in terms of their personal lives, is inflation. GM uh, has to watch because you purchase so many inputs for your, for your business. Watch inflation very carefully. Watch producer prices. You're, if anybody's in a position to have a, a kind of leading indicator view, uh, it's your company. Tell us what you're seeing in terms of prices, whether you see them moderating, uh, moderating significantly. What kind, of, what kind of bets are you making as you do your planning about, about future prices? Well, right now, um, uh, demand is really strong. But remember, we've been in a supply-constrained 
environment in the auto industry um, since since the pandemic first first uh, hap uh, happened. So in, since 2020, we've really been in a supply constrained uh, market. So we are still seeing very strong demand, even with uh, a strong pricing environment as well. Uh, it's something we watch on a weekly basis, uh, uh, you know, watching to see what the consumer is doing. But right now, again, we're seeing, and, and interestingly, really strong demand for trucks and high-end trucks. And so, I, but again, I think it's because we've been in a supply constrained environment for so long. So I think, you know, as we move and, and we get more chips and have less uh, uh, part shortages, supply will become more robust and then, you know, we'll watch to see what happens. But it's hard to predict because this has been such a unique situation. Do you, do you see prices moderated, prices of what you buy uh, uh, moderating. You, do you see signs of that beginning? Uh, you know, fuel, for instance, is something, you know, uh, just the, uh, for all of our transportation, we're seeing, you know, gas prices start to come down. That impacts us as well as the end customer. Uh, but, you know, we've seen a lot of headwinds from commodities, um, you, you know, year over year to the tune of about $5 billion. Uh, and, you know, we're working, we always work to how do we offset that? How do we become more efficient? Uh, but that has led to, um, you know, pricing increases as well. Uh, but so again, it's something we watch. So I'm not really seeing a lot come down yet, but I think um, as time goes by, I, you know, I think we'll see things start to moderate a bit. So this sounds like, f from your perspective, this is not as transitory as people hope, that you're, you're seeing some moderation, but not, not yet significant. No, but again, I think um, we're maybe not the, the industry to look at because of the constraints that we, we've had. Um, I think it's going to, we, we believe we're going to have strong demand well into next year and beyond, just be, and because there's so much pent-up demand. So I don't know if we're a good uh, indicator of, of overall inflation. Yes, you mentioned the CHIPS Act earlier, and uh, one significant constraint for the auto industry, but business in general, has been the shortage of CHIPS. Is that finally past us now? You know, every quarter it gets a little better, and, you know, we said this year we would, you know, build significantly more vehicles, 25 to 30 percent more vehicles. We're on track to do that. It was met with some skepticism at the beginning of the year when we said that, but you know, we will still, at the end of the year and as we enter first quarter of next year, we will still not be uh, unconstrained as it relates to a chip situation. So we'll see it linger into next year, but it is getting better. So I want to ask about what uh, the movement to all electric vehicles is going to mean for your company over time. Okay. And, and one uh, first uh, point of, of interest is, is jobs. Okay. Uh, is this going to create jobs? Uh, will those jobs be in the United States? Can you give us any estimates through the rest of this decade what, what it will mean for GM, assuming your plans go as you hope, uh, in terms of jobs? Will you be adding significant jobs, and where will they be? Well, first off, we see um, the manufacturing capability that we have and the talented people of, of General Motors that, you know, build high-quality vehicles safety, safely every day. We see that as a huge uh, competitive advantage because we have people who know how to do it and do it well. So what you see us doing is making announcements, and as we ramp up EVs, we're dedicate, you know, we're allocating EVs uh, or components for EVs into our existing footprint. So that's something we'll continue to do. It, it's an advantage not only because of the workforce, it's also an advantage because we have the facility, and yes, we have to modify it to build that vehicle, but we do that every time we do a new, a new model of something. So we see that as a huge opportunity. And then from an overall number perspective, one of the things General Motors has done, uh, and we committed to this you know, a couple years ago, is doing battery cell production in this country. So in the past that had been done in Asia, we've brought that uh, to this country. And as I've mentioned, we've said they'll have at least four plants uh, in this country building cells. Each of those plants at the rate of the size that we're building um, is about, is over a thousand jobs each. So um, there's an opportunity to look at where the supply chain was in the past, what should be done in this country. As we've sourced um, all of the raw materials and precious metals that we need for batteries, we're also looking to either onshore or ally shore. And so that will bring new jobs uh, to many places in not only the United States, Canada, et cetera. So I, I think with some consumers, uh, it's fair to say that electric vehicles have had a reputation for being expensive. 
Uh, some of them are pretty darn expensive when you, when you look at, at the range of, uh, of the market. You are trying across your product line to, to have electric vehicles at different price points. And, and you just uh, revealed last week, you and I were talking about this before, uh, your new uh, electric Equinox with a, a price tag that's more in the area that, uh, that the average consumer can afford. We've got a clip that I hope we're rolling of, of the Equinox. T tell me a little bit about how you're able to create a crossover vehicle like this, the kind of thing you see on the road everywhere, at a, at a price point that's closer to, 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 to what, what people can afford. Well, I think that's where General Motors scale comes into play and the fact that, you know, a couple as I said, back in 18, we realized we needed a dedicated platform. So the Ultium platform can do vehicles like an a Equinox EV all the way to a super truck. That kind of scale and then the fact that we'll have our own batteries, that allows us to get costs down. And, and for instance, the Equinox, I'm so proud of that vehicle. It'll be around $30,000, which is in the heart of the market. And that segment is the largest segment of a vehicle sold. And so having a vehicle that's priced right and uh, they'll see when they get, you know, get a chance to look at the vehicle, a 17 inch, 17.7 uh, actually inch display. Uh, Super Cruise will be available. That's our driver assistance technology. There's also a host of safety features on that vehicle. So connectivity. So it's a great vehicle that will, you know, add a lot of value. And to get the kind of adoption that we're looking for, we need to have value. Uh, we need to have uh, vehicles that provide that value in that price point. And we're really excited. And you know, those are customers we have a, a strong relationship when we've had. General Motors has the highest customer loyalty in this country. So we're very excited about being able to you know, really make EVs for everyone. So let's talk about how to s sell these vehicles to the public. Yesterday, uh, Ford, uh, your great historic uh, competitor, asked uh, its dealers, nearly 3,000 of them, to invest uh, in upgrades to sell uh, electric vehicles and said it will offer the option to become an EV certified dealer. And I'm curious whether GM is considering or maybe already has done something similar with your dealer network and more broadly, Mary, how are you going to get your dealer network to make the transition with you? Sure. Well, we've been working with our dealers for the last several years and recognizing the customers changing. And we, you know, we, we looked and said, let's work together to figure out not only how to, how to meet the customer where they're at, whether they want to buy the vehicle completely online or whether they literally want to go to the dealer and kick the tires. And so we've developed the systems. But then we also started to work with the dealers and say, how do we make the cost of selling a vehicle less expensive? And so we started working together. Uh, there's a number of things that we've done, whether it's, uh, we realized they were spending a lot of money on their IT systems. And so we actually invested in and work with Techion, which is a startup company that has worked on not only the back office systems that the dealers need, but now we have a system called our, it's our dealer retail platform, which is how they can do everything online. And, and again, it's a system um, that will take cost out from an uh, from a IT perspective. We've also said, look, we're using data analytics to say, if you're a dealer in this region, here's the vehicles that you should order with these options to be fast movers. Our dealers are also, you know, our dealers are entrepreneurs. And so they've also learned how to sell deep into the channel. They know when a vehicle's on its way on a truck and often every vehicle on that truck by the time it gets to the dealership is sold. Then they don't have as many vehicles on their lot. Frankly, they don't have many at all right now. They're not financing them. So we're doing a lot of things to take cost out of the selling process. So, uh, and, and the way I look at it is our dealers are an asset. They're known in the community. They have the relationship. It's one thing when you're buying an EV and it's your second, third, fourth, or fifth car. It's another thing when you're buying it and it's your only vehicle and you depend on it every day to take care of your family, to get to work, to earn your livelihood. And so um, that trust that's there of if I have a problem, they're going to they're going to be there for me to take care of me. They're going to help me understand the technology that's on this vehicle. I think that's hugely valuable. So what we've done, we, we already worked with our Cadillac channel and but we also re realized some people maybe don't want to adapt their business. And so we worked with Cadillac and, and like we're now doing with Buick GMC of here's what we'd like you to do to invest. If not, 
you know, here's the, here's the off-ramp. And so we've been on this journey. It went fairly well with our Cadillac dealers. We're now working um, across our, our dealerships to do this. And what I'm finding, though, with the people who sign up and say, hey, yeah, I want to be a part of the all-electric future, they're excited, and they're making the investments to be able to service the vehicles. They're also doing the dealer education piece, and we're, we're providing a lot of material to do that. We have um, EV Live, which provides a lot of information. So um, I'm very excited that our dealers are, are embracing this and choosing to be part of this future. And again, this is something we've been working on for a couple of years now. Let me ask uh, just the obvious question. Have you had uh, much dealer resistance to the transformation that you're making at the company? I'd be surprised if there wasn't some. And you mentioned earlier that dealers who just aren't comfortable with this, you're going to provide the off-ramp. What does that mean, that, that, that they'll go out of the business of selling GM vehicles? What, what, what happens? You know, they'll, they'll either, you know, they'll either sell their point or their, you know, depending, you know, you have to look at dealers. I mean, I think we all have a vision of what a dealer is, but at General Motors, we have some dealers that sell five, 50, less than 50 vehicles a year. And we have some that sell 50, you know, almost a week or at least in a month or more. And so, it's, it, that's where we have to give those dealers choices because in, in some cases it may not make sense for them to make that investment. And then depending on, you know, uh, there's, it's actually a plan for every dealership. If a dealer raises their hand and says, hey, I, I, I don't plan on uh, being a part of the, of the EV future. But I would say I'm thrilled with the dealers that have signed up and want to be a part of it. And they're excited too, especially when they see the portfolio of vehicles we have coming. Uh, so that, but that's the process. We, you know, we're working with our dealers. So you're you're partnering with Honda uh, in part of this this new mm -hmm. space. Tell us a little a little bit about that partnership. That sounds like a like a new direction for for GM. Uh, tell us what you're going to produce and why this is the right partner. Well, you know, we've been working with Honda for years. We started working with Honda um, on hydrogen fuel cells because we do believe ultimately hydrogen fuel cells will be part of the solution. Our, our version is called the Hydrotech. And we did that so we could, um, you know, pool our technical talent and, and, and share the cost. Uh, so that's something that we've been doing for a while. Then uh, Honda is also invested in Cruise, our autonomous driving uh, company. Uh, so we're, we're partners there. They also, there's a few vehicles we're doing for them, leveraging the Ultium platform. And then we also said together, we're gonna to work on affordable electric vehicles. And so uh, it's a partnership uh, that's very important because at the technical level, there's tremendous respect for each other's, uh, each other's talent. And they can work together and, and do great things. Because, you know, let's face it, there's been a lot of uh, tried, uh, you know, partnerships, JVs, projects, between auto companies that hasn't hasn't been that successful, but because of the, the way we started and we keep building on what we do with Honda, uh, tremendous respect for the company and the talent, and I think it's uh, it's re reciprocated. You uh, mentioned your uh, cruise program, and uh, this is a fascinating uh, thing that you're, that you're doing. If our viewers don't know, you're developing uh, driverless robo taxis. Mm -hmm. I think you call them. Uh, you recently took a ride in one, yes. uh, and I think we have a clip that's going to show you and, and the, and the robo-taxi we want to play. Let's take a look at that. Sure. Oh, my God! Yeah. And I just clicked okay. open. <laughs> I'm going to try to plant a little camera here. Starting your trip. Let's cruise. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> this is incredible. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> this is unbelievable. This is crazy. There's oh, nobody driving no, right now. It's too bad that we have to wear masks, though, because I, I can't stop smiling. <laughs> it's so smooth. Oh, it is. The, the throttle progression, the, the steering angles, oh, the arc, man. everything. I always believed that we'd be doing it, but to actually be doing it, it's just surreal. So you said after that uh, ride, that's a nice little piece of film, that this was one of the highlights of your career. Mm -hmm. And I want you to explain to us why. Well, if you think about it, 90% of fatalities in the U.S. are caused by driver error. Uh, has plays a role in it. So imagine a world where the vehicle pays attention all the time, knows all the traffic rules, isn't distracted or impaired. Uh, and, you know, when, when I did the ride, I, it, it, it was, you know, at first you're like, oh my gosh, there's no one in the front seat and the steering wheel's moving. But you quickly get 
and you see how capable the ride is. And it's, it's, very, it's a very confident capable to the point you're like, yeah, I'll do this. And we've had so many people who have, have taken rides and crews in San Francisco. We're, we're now the only company in a dense urban environment and charging for rides. And uh, I'm so proud of the team. Riding with me was Kyle Vode, who's uh, the CEO and co-founder of Cruise. Uh, you know, it's a company that we acquired in 2016 when it had 40 people, and it now has 3,000. And this is technology that will truly change the world. It'll change, uh, change the way we move, and I'm, I'm just so excited to be a part of it um, because it, it's one of the most significant technologies of our generation. So you're moving forward with this um, aggressively. Yeah. You will start this robo-taxi service in Phoenix and Austin this fall, mm -hmm. uh, from what I've read, uh, and you're hoping that Cruise will bring in a billion dollars in revenue by 2025. Uh, that, that, those are really startling numbers. I want to ask you two things. We keep reading stories about AI glitches, and there are famous things in the literature about how the AI decides whether the child uh, pedestrian or the old uh, man or woman on the sidewalk, you know, which way to swerve and, and all those decisions. Are, are you confident, as you, as you talk to your, your engineers, that those uh, extremely subtle and difficult technology problems really are solved in a way that you're comfortable? Well, safety uh, from day one, and actually the very first conversation I had with Kyle when we were discussing, um, you know, working together was safety. And I wanted to make sure we had the same overarching principles of safety. And safety has guided everything that Cruise has done. We had safety, um, uh, milestones that we had to achieve before we would take the driver out of the vehicle. And I think if you if you go online and watch some of the videos, you see what the vehicle is able to accomplish. So again, when you look at the significance of the technology and what's happening on the roads today of how many people are dying, um, you know, the safety goals we've, we've set, um, I think, uh, and we've met, and we'll continue to hold ourselves accountable to meet those. Um, I, I, again, that's what gives me confidence in the technology. So I want to ask you a little bit about, about broader issues of climate change. G GM has said, uh, according to my notes, that it plans to be carbon neutral by 2040. Mm -hmm. That's uh, an ambitious goal. And I, I want to ask you in terms of the specifics of getting there, what are the, the tent poles in that? What are the, the most ambitious, challenging, and important parts of that program that will get you to carbon neutral by 2040? Well, I mean, it's, it's really looking at every part of our business to, to, to get there. Um, a big portion of it, though, because a lot of, from a, from a car company's perspective, is the vehicles that we're producing. And so to get to an all-electric future, as we've said, in this country, we'll be all-electric by 2035. Uh, we also have ambitious goals in China, and we're looking in our other markets. Um, you know, uh, there's several markets where EV um, uh, interest in EVs and actually the demand for EVs is growing, so we think we'll be well positioned. But that's number one, getting the products. We've been on, on a journey for a while to work to get our, all of our plants to be uh, working on renew, uh, renewable energy, and we have you know a plan for all of it. So when we put the goal out, it, originally a couple of years ago, we said by 2050, and then the team kept working and they said, you know, we can pull this into 2040. And so that's the work that we continue to do. Um, you know, we have a whole team of engineers and and uh, technical people working on exactly every step we need to do in our operations, with our products, every aspect of our business. So I have great confidence we'll achieve that goal. And, and a tough question, but your shareholders would, would want me to ask this. Do you have uh, rules that uh, guide you that say that if trying to meet these ambitious goals, which are good for the planet, are going to mean you have a significant hit in your in your profits and in effect will be I think the term is concessionary that you'll pull back or are you committed to doing this no matter what even if you do end up taking a hit 
Well, I think we were very thoughtful before we said it. It wasn't something we just said, hey, let's go do this. You know, we were very thoughtful on what will it take and what do we need to do. And so I think we have the plans. And in many cases, as we make the improvements uh, and, you know, for instance, use renewable energies, it actually provides a cost savings to us. So um, I think, you know, we have a well thought out plan. Certainly there's challenges to solve. I'm an engineer by degree. That's what we do. We solve issues. So I have confidence that we're going to find solutions to anything that may look like it's going to be a cost increase or something that's, you know, uh, material that will look and work and find solutions. So we have less than two minutes left. I want to close by asking you to, to think about American business more broadly. You ha have just become the chair of the Business Roundtable, which is one of the most prominent business organizations. So I want to ask you what you, you hope to accomplish in that leadership role, what you said as your one or two uh, most important priorities in this role as, as, as chair? Well, I think, um, first off, I, it's not me alone. I mean, the member companies and the CEOs that do so much work, as well as the very talented staff that's led by Josh Bolton, they do a tremendous job. And, you know, we're working to improve um, America's competitiveness. Uh, and to make sure we're making the right investments and we're going to, you know, uh, make the, you know, help the economy become more healthy, improve our competitiveness while making sure, um, you know, that we have a voice in the regulatory environment to make sure we have smart regulation, not something that, you know, puts roadblocks up and ends up costing more. But then there's, so that's kind of from a policy perspective. But then in addition, there's work we can do of sharing between all the companies to improve workforce development, uh, education, uh, and what we can do to strengthen not only the workers of today, but you know the pipeline that's coming. And so I'm really proud of the work of, of BRT and proud to, to humbly have this chair role for uh, this period of time. And, and it's just a pleasure to work with all the other CEOs. Last quick question. You're one of the top executives in the country, in the, in the world. Um, you're a, a prominent uh, American woman CEO. So I need to ask you, at, at the level that you are, do you still experience sexism? Um, you know, not really. I mean, I think, I think everyone, I, I always look, I always try to give people the benefit of the doubt, assume goodness. And so when somebody says something, you're like, wow, that's a little, you know, but okay, what frame of reference were they coming from? What did they mean? I mean, if somebody says something that I, I feel was, you know, intentional, you know, there's an opportunity to have a conversation. And I always frame that with a, let, a learning to begin with. And, and, and if it goes in a different direction, well, then okay. But I, I try to assume goodness. Um, frankly, you know, one of, the, one of the things that was a surprise to me when I became the CEO of General Motors, uh, you know, I hope I got this role. I feel I got this role because I earned it, not because of my gender. But um, when people come up to me and they say, my daughter is now going to study engineering because you've mot if you can do it, she believes she can do that. So if I can be a role model for young women and girls to pursue math and science and, and just pursue whatever they want to do, do and believe they can do it, that's something that you know, was a very nice uh, surprise and you know, very rewarding to me. Mary Barra, the Chief Executive of General Motors, really a pleasure to have you here. We hope you'll, you'll come back. Um, we want to thank all of you for joining us on Washington Post Live. If you want to see other programming we've got coming up, please go to WashingtonPostLive.com. Uh, Mary, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, David. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.